This is Jesus speaking about Israel. Cut it down. Kind of shocking words. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, there's mercy in this, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. A little later in the chapter, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Listen to how he describes her. The city that kills the prophets. There's what she's known for. And stones those who are sent to it. That's what she's known for. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? Now listen to these words. Behold, your house is forsaken. Another translation, King James, I think. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. They've rejected Christ, and he rejects them. This is Jesus' low ami moment. I'm the word of God. I will build my house. I will build my house. Welcome to Grounded. I'm Steve Hartland, pastor at Cornerstone Community Church in Joppa, Maryland. And today, our topic is a timely one. You're paying attention to the news, and you know there's something going on with Israel and Hamas. So well, there's a big war cooking up over there. So the question is, uh, does this have any Bible prophetic significance? Like, Uh, There are lots of people now who have this view that, uh, oh, man, anytime anything happens with Israel, uh, we better really watch because now the prophetic clock is ticking loudly and there's something going on and this could be signaling the end and so on and so forth. Um, Is there any special prophetic significance to what's going on over there right now? Now, let me just say up front, Christians will differ on this. And that's all right. We can differ on this. Romans chapter 14, I love it. It says, receive one another, but not to disputes about doubtful things. There are things that are doubtful. It's not so clear from the Bible. And there are different views of eschatology and what's coming and what will happen and so on in the Bible. And people with equally high views of Scripture, they believe it's the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, authoritative and sufficient, uh, land in different places on this. So we can land on different places. I'm sure that in the church where I'm one of the pastors, we have people who land in different places. I bet some of our pastors land in different places. That's quite all right. We can all work together. But is there any prophetic significance to what's going on? The short story is, my position is, I hope by the end of this podcast, it'll be your position. My position is, well, no. Actually, there's a general prophetic significance, and that is that our Lord told us, you will hear all the way down through this age of wars and rumors of wars, but that is not the end yet. So just because there's a war going on doesn't mean, oh, man, maybe this is the end. No, Jesus actually said, you're going to hear that through the whole time, wars and rumors. And sure enough, there's always a war. Somebody has even said that peace is that time when humanity is getting ready for their next war. We're always fighting wars. So there's a general prophetic significance. But is there anything particularly significant about, oh, man, this is Israel, it's war, and the clock must be ticking? I'm going to say no. Why? Let me give you this short story. We're going to go to this passage a little later. But over in Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul explains a lot about how we should think about Israel and the church and ourselves and so on. And he says over in Romans chapter 11 that what what God has done is this. There's Abraham. There's the Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to give you land, seed, blessing, and all that. Israel comes out of Abraham. And so Israel participates in the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. However, at a certain point, like especially when they rejected Christ, God in Romans 11, it talks about it this way. He cut them out of the root. He removed them from the—they're no longer rooted in the Abrahamic covenant. They are out of covenant with God. And instead, he started, Ephesians 2, one new man, Jew and Gentile together, and one new thing called, called the church. And that's, that's the thing. From here on out, it's, it's church. It's not an Israel program anymore. It's church. Israel is rooted in the Abrahamic covenant, and the church is rooted in the Abrahamic covenant, but the church has been changed. It's one new man, Ephesians chapter 2. So what you want to watch is what's happening with the church. What's happening with Israel is the same as what's happening with any other nation. We're not anti-Semitic, not for any reason at all, and you shouldn't be. Um, In fact, I'm glad there are American allies, and let's be loyal to our allies. But we're not anti-Semitic because they're just plain people, unsaved people who need gospel, the gospel and the love of Christ. So Romans 11 is going to be the key to a lot of this. But let me let me give you more. You want more? There you just got a bird's eye view. If you want more, here we go. Here's more. So we would all agree that national Israel was God's chosen people. 
So you can start with the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter, chapter 12, chapter 16, 17, and, and other passages. Um, and God promised land, seed, and blessing, and Israel participated in that covenant. But there were times, there were numerous times, where they broke the covenant that they were in with God. And so God said, you're not my people and I'm not your God. The most famous one of those is in Hosea chapter 1. Hosea is told to take a wife. Her name is Gomer. They have it. They conceive and she has a child. And God tells them what to name the child. And he says, I want you to name that child in the Hebrew. It's Lo-Ami. Lo-Ami means not my people. Name the child, this has prophetic significance, name the child, not my people, because you're not my people and I am not your God. So that's really profound. you got to note that. God said to his old covenant people during the days of the old covenant, covenant I'm discovenanting you. You're not my people. I'm not your God. Now, Israel today is in the very same state of unbelief, maybe worse. They're in the very same state of unbelief. Current Israel is not, in any sense of the, the words, God's people. We hear Christians all the time saying, oh, they're God's people. They're, God. they're really not. They weren't God's people under Hosea and other times in the Old Testament, and they're not God's people now. They're out of covenant with God. This happened again when Jesus came, not just in Hosea, but when Jesus came, they rejected Christ, and ever since then, they are low on me. This doesn't lead to anti-Semitism. They're just people who are unsaved like any other people on the earth who are unsaved. But they're low on me. They're not God's people, and he is not their God. The church of Jesus Christ is God's people, and he is their God. So uh, that's a little bit more. Now let me give you some more. We're going to go to a famous Old Testament passage for more here. So you remember that in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. I'm going to use mainly Jeremiah 31 today. God says, look, Israel broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. I brought them out of Egypt, and I made a covenant with them, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. They broke. He loved them. He provided for them. They broke his covenant. God says in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, but the day is going to come when I'm going to make a new covenant with whom? With the house of Israel. And that day came, and it was the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus came, and by his own shed blood, he ratified that covenant. His blood was the blood of the new covenant. We take communion, do this in remembrance of me. We're, we're drinking, we're eating the bread and drinking the cup. It's the blood of the covenant that we're remembering. God promised to make Israel a new covenant. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And what are the terms of the new covenant? He said that's not going to be like the old covenant. What was the old covenant like? In the Old Covenant, you had a mixed people. You had a mixed bag. You had people who were saved, regenerate, believers, had hearts for God, and you had people who weren't. But they were both very much in the Old Covenant. God says, here's what the New Covenant's going to be like. Everybody who's in the New Covenant, now I'm just paraphrasing, will be saved. I'll write my law in their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Everybody who's in the New Covenant is regenerated, born again, saved, have hearts for God, love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. God said there's, there's coming a new covenant, and Jesus came and ratified that covenant. And that means the old covenant, read the book of Hebrews, the old covenant is over. The old covenant is done, and we're not going back. That would be retrograde. We're never going back to the old covenant. Read the book of Hebrews. The new covenant is better. It's got better promises. It was made with the sacrifice of Christ, not bulls and goats and lambs and whatever. So we're in the days of the new covenant, and in the new covenant, everybody who's in that covenant is born again. So unsaved, unregenerate Israelites are not in the new covenant. They're not born again. They don't have hearts for Christ. The blood of Christ does not cover their sins. They're yet in their sins. So God says, I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm done with the old one. The book of Hebrews says, the minute he said new, that one started getting old. I like that. So, yeah, it, it got old and it passed away. And we're in the days of the new covenant, and again, we're never going back. Now, let's go down to the time of Jesus, and right before Jesus shows up, John the Baptist is the forerunner. Listen to what John the Baptist says Jesus will do. He says, Matthew three eleven, 
I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. People get wacky on the fire part there. The rest of the verse is going to tell us what he means by fire. Fire is bad. You don't want fire. Fire is like, that's the fire of hell. The Holy Spirit is good. You want that. He's going to lead you to saving faith in Christ. He's going to baptize believers and unbelievers. He's going to baptize believers with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize unbelievers with fire. Let's go on. Verse 12. Christ, when he comes, his winnowing fork is in his hands. What's a winnowing fork? Well, you're out on your threshing floor, and you've got wheat and chaff, and you want to separate them, so you grab the fork, you toss it up in the air, the wind blows, and uh, the, the wheat is heavier and falls, and the chaff is light, and it blows away. Christ is coming, John the Baptist says. He's going to baptize believers with the Holy Spirit and unbelievers with fire. He's got a winnowing fork in his hand. What do you do with a winnowing fork? You separate. You call out the true, and you blow away the false. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear. It's actually a Greek word that would be better translated purge. I believe in the King James it's purge. He will purge his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn. There's the fire. He will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. There's the fire. So he's coming with the Holy Spirit. That's going to be for the wheat. He's going to gather them into his barn, but he's going to blow away all the chaff. What's he doing? He's separating true Israel out of national Israel. He's separating Israelites who are Israelites indeed out of national Israel. He's calling out the people who are going to be part of the new covenant, who will be in the new covenant. He's his winnowing fork is in his hand. He's clearing. He's purging his threshing floor. Only believers are going to be allowed in my new work. I'm, I'm moving away. All the non-believers will only have believers in Israel from here on out. That's John the Baptist. What comes next? Jesus in Luke 13. How he dealt with what he says about unbelieving Israel. Listen to this, Luke 13, 6. And he told this parable. Here's the parable. A man, that's God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit. That, that's God. A man, that's Christ had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. That has roots in Micah roots. In Micah 7 and Isaiah 5, we're talking about Israel. He planted a, a, a fig tree in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it. That's Christ coming to earth. That's Christ in the days of his incarnation. He came seeking fruit in his vineyard, on his tree, and he found none. That's Israel. Israel was unfruitful. They rejected him. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, how long was Jesus' earthly ministry? Three years. For three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Listen to what comes next. This is Jesus speaking about Israel. Cut it down. Kind of shocking words. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, there's mercy in this, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. A little later in the chapter, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Listen to how he describes her. The city that kills the prophets. There's what she's known for. And stones those who are sent to it. That's what she's known for. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? Now listen to these words. Behold, your house is forsaken. Another translation, King James, I think. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. They've rejected Christ, and he rejects them. This is Jesus' low ami moment. He's saying, these people aren't my people. These people aren't my nation. I'm calling out the true believers. There's, uh, that, there's, who was it? Was that Zacchaeus? No, I think I got him confused. Who was the Israelite in whom, that was Nathaniel, the Israelite in whom there is no guile. He's calling out the Israelites in whom there is no guile. But Israel as a house is being forsaken. Unbelieving Israel is being forsaken. There's more about this. Later in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 20, we have the parable of the vineyard. Let me just read it for you. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard. This is God in Israel. 
and let it out to tenants, those are the leaders of Israel, and went into another country for a long while. God's up in heaven, and the people are down here. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants, that's an Old Testament prophet, so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killed the prophets. And he sent another servant, there's another prophet, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, this one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. We all know who that is. Prophet, 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 they stoned them, they beat them, they killed them. He says, I'll send my son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. That's what they said. It was out of jealousy that they killed Jesus. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner, God the Father, of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. So he's going to do away with the scribes and the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the whole nation, and he's going to give the vineyard to others. Who are they? The apostles and prophets of the new covenant. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written, the stone that the builders rejected? has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls in that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him, Luke chapter 20. John the Baptist says he's going to purge his floor. Jesus says, you guys aren't going to be the leaders anymore. We're giving it to a new group of leaders. They're going to be new covenant apostles and prophets. There's more about this in Ephesians chapter 2. What's the current status of unbelieving Israel? Uh, We're finding out. Ephesians 2, verse 14, For he, Christ himself, is our peace, who has made both, Jews and Gentiles, one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, the Mosaic law, expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Wow, what did Christ do? He created one new man. It started off with the called out true believers in Israel who are rooted in the Abrahamic covenant, who who have their their they are trees and they're they've got roots that go down into the Abrahamic covenant. He called them out and made them his new covenant people. And then Romans eleven, Gentiles get grafted in with them. We believers are grafted in with them, and it's one new thing, it's one new man. It's also called the church. Listen to how that works. We're going to go to Romans 9 for a minute. I hope you're staying with me. Romans 9, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. What's he answering there? He's answering the question, if Jesus is really Messiah, how come national Israel didn't go after him en masse? Did the word fail? No, it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Ah, see, there's a new definition of Israel. Now you're only Israel if you're a believer. You're only Israel if you're a follower of Christ. Jesus called out true Israel from national mixed Israel. He called out to true believers and said, now, this is Israel now. His man Paul says that for him. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In other words, just because you have blood that runs back to Israel doesn't mean you can say, so I am Israel. No, you're Israel in blood only. You're Israel in name only, but you're not Israel in heart. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac your offspring shall be named, Paul explains. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. Israel in their current state are not the children of God. They're not God's people, and he is not their God. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring, Jew or Gentile, If you're children of the promise, if you have saving faith like your father Abraham, then you are counted by God as offspring. Those are my children, and I am their God, and I am their father. Back to Romans 11. Paul says, but if some of the branches, national Israelites, were broken off, they were due to their unbelief, and you, a Gentile, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, 
and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. So that's what happened. They were broken off because of their unbelief. You were added in because you bowed the knee and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're grafted in to the root, which Christ called out and purified the new Israel. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. Can God graft Israelis back in? Can he give them hearts to believe in Christ and be saved? Absolutely, and he does. And depending on how you read Romans 11, he might do that in a large group and mass one day. Um, for, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, that's the second time he does that. If you're a Gentile, I'm a Gentile, I'm a wild olive tree. Tell your wife, honey, I'm a wild olive tree. All right, that's what you are. If you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, Israel, you've been grafted into Israel. How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? If God can save Gentiles and graft them into the Abrahamic root, surely he can save Israelites and graft them into the Abrahamic root. So there's one new man. It started with the called out Jewish believers to which Gentiles were added, into which Gentiles were grafted, were grafted into the blessings and the benefits of the covenant God made with Abraham. And this is the one new man, and we're not going back. There's not some future age where we're going to go back to a national Israel plan and bring back the law of Moses. We're not going back. Paul says more about this in Galatians 6. Verses 15 and 16, he says, For neither circumcision counts for anything. Uh, excuse me, Paul. M Moses commanded it. That's right. And Christ has rescinded that command, or rather he has fulfilled that command. And circumcision doesn't count for anything. Nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, even upon the Israel of God. Paul calls Jew and Gentile saved in the church, in the body of Christ, the Israel of God. God says of them, they are my people. They say, he is my God. They're the Israel of God. If you're a Gentile believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of the Israel of God. You've been grafted in with the true believers that Christ called out when he was here in his first incarnation or in, his, in the days of his incarnation. A little bit more. Hanging with me? Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. John, who was Jewish, has very strong words to describe the Jewish people of his day who rejected Christ. These words don't lead to anti-Semitism, but they're very strong words. Revelation 2, 9, and repeats it in Revelation 3, 9. And he talks about those in his day, those who say they are Jews and are not John understands there's a new definition of who's Jews and who's isn't, and the only people who are really Jews are the believing ones. There are those who say they are Jews and are not, now listen to how he describes them twice, but are a synagogue of Satan. When you see Christ rejecting, unbelieving Jewish people worshiping in a synagogue, don't say, oh, what a beautiful thing. They're worshiping God in the Old Covenant way. No, John called them a synagogue of Satan. It was not a beautiful thing. They're doing what they're doing because they absolutely rejected Christ and killed him. Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. Listen to Revelation 21, 2. We read about a new Jerusalem that supersedes the old Jerusalem, the one that Christ left desolate, the one that killed the prophets. There's a new Jerusalem, Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. What do you know about a bride in redemptive history? Who's the bride? The bride of Christ is the church. He loved his church, his bride, and gave himself for. And John sees what is a new Jerusalem that is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem is the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Who's that? That's the church. 
we're going to see the church. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. The church is the holy city. The church is the new Jerusalem. It had great high wall. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. It's rooted in the old covenant. And on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. One new man. All of the old covenant people of God, the true believers, and all of the new covenant people of God, Jew and Gentile, now one new man, the bride, the church of Jesus Christ, are the new Jerusalem seen as coming down out of heaven. So what are we seeing? We began by asking the question, oh man, is there, is there prophetic significance? God's working with his people again? No, what I'm saying is the Bible pretty clearly says they're not his people. They're out of covenant with God. They're not his people unless they bow the knee and confess Jesus as Lord. Otherwise, they're just like anybody else on the planet. They're unbelieving people who need the love of Christ, who need the gospel. We should love them. They're our neighbor. We love them as ourselves. But let me summarize. Here's several points of summary. One, current Israel, let's just try and make it clear, they are not the people of God. They are not in covenant with God. They are forsaken by God. They are forsaken by the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, your house is left to you desolate. Second point, trying to close and be clear here, the war is not a sign that the prophetic clock is ticking. The prophetic clock is always ticking. We're in the last days, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. It's all the last days. We don't know when he's coming back. It could be right now. It wasn't. Or it could be a long, long time from now. But the war is not a sign that, oh, man, things are really happening now. It's just fulfillment of the general promise that Christ made. There will be wars and rumors of wars, but these are not the end yet. A third thing I want to say again is just this. Knowing this does not lead to any anti-Semitism. I know in some cases, like with, let's say, Martin Luther and some of his followers, it sort of did. But that's a a non sequitur. That doesn't follow. It doesn't automatically lead to any anti-Semitism, and it should not. Because what are unbelieving people? People we're supposed to love and preach the gospel to. Uh, A fourth point. Uh, Again, let me just make this clear. Israel going to war does not fulfill any particular prophecy. And that land is no longer the Holy Land. I'd love to go there. I'd probably even call it the Holy Land if I went there. I'd love to see Jerusalem. I'd love to visit. Probably won't ever get to. But it's really not the Holy Land. The Holy Land is the church. The new Jerusalem is is the church of Jesus Christ, his bride. And Israel going to war doesn't fulfill any particular prophecy of Scripture. Again, I want to just say, personally, now this is a political comment. I shouldn't go there. I'm all in favor of having Israel as an ally. I'm all in favor of being loyal to our allies. Let's be loyal to Israel. Uh, I don't know whether we ought to go to war with them. Is this going to be World War III? I'm kind of on the side of let's not go to war here, but I'm in favor of our supporting them. This is not what this podcast is about. They are, however, not in covenant with God. A fifth and final point, we didn't see this in Romans 9, but it's there. We should pray for Israel's conversion. We should evangelize Jewish friends just as much as we evangelize Gentile friends. Paul in Romans 9 says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. About what? His desire that they would be saved. He even says, I'm willing to be accursed if it could mean they would all come to Christ. Wow, Paul. Like, I couldn't say that. I don't think I could say that. But he did. So we should pray for Israel's conversion. Well, again, Romans 14, Christians can differ over this, and they do. And we should receive one another, and yet not to disputes about doubtful things. These things are, they're not doubtful in my mind, but they are doubtful because good believers disagree on these things. You can take a different position and be a sincere and serious follower of Jesus Christ. Bless you for that. But I hope I've at least given you some things to think about that, hmm, maybe what I was taught about Israel doesn't really line up with the words of Scripture and Christ and his apostles. Well, thank you for listening today. That's Grounded. You can find us on the major platforms. If you like us, give us a like, give us a comment, share us with a friend. Thanks for being here today.